समझ अपनी भाषा में ही आता है कंटेंट आपकी भाषा में ओनली ऑन डेली हंट हमें पता है आपको क्या चाहिए अपनी पसंद का कंटेंट ओनली ऑन डेली हंट रखो अपने एरिया की खबर लोकल अपडेट्स ओनली ऑन डेली हंट वे डिलाइट टू वेलकम यू बैक टू द फोर्टीन जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाई डेट ऑल Locking down the poor, the pandemic, and India's moral center. Harsh Mandar in conversation with Arun Mayra. This session is presented in partnership with the Daily Hunt. In his powerful new book, Locking Down the Poor, Harsh Mandar examines India's response to the pandemic with particular emphasis on the ramifications of imposing the world's longest and strictest lockdown and its harsh consequences. for the less fortunate in the country from the highways and overcrowded quarantine centers he brings us stories of migrant workers who walked hundreds of kilometers to their villages or were prevented from doing so and detained collating ground information and grassroots reportage he lays bare the reality of the humanitarian crisis tracing responsibility to state institutions and policy choices harsh mandar is one of india's most trusted and courageous social justice and human rights activists he is the author of several acclaimed books on contemporary india among them looking away inequality prejudice and indifference in new india and ash in the belly india's unfinished battle against hunger arun mayra has an unusual combination of hands on leadership experience in the private sector in government and in the social sector He was a member of India's planning commission from 2009 to 14. He is a thought leader on process of institutional transformation. He is the author of several books including Transforming Systems, Why the we- World Needs a New Ethical Toolkit and Listening for Wellbeing, Conversations with People Not Like Us. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, locking down the poor the pandemic and india's moral center harsh mandar in conversation with arun mayra uh i was asked to start off by talking about very briefly about my book uh and i'll do it very briefly because professor arun mayra is here and i think the conversation will be far more interesting uh but many people asked me why and when did i write this book Uh, I think the book took took seed in my mind and heart uh, the evening when which changed India uh, when our Prime Minister announced with three and a half hours notice that the entire country would be locked down. Uh, while he was speaking, he was talking about you know stay at home, work from home, keep social distance. wash your hands and you'll be safe and while i was listening to him i said he's our prime minister has he forgotten that the large majority of indians in cities to start with either don't have homes and i work with homeless people uh for the last two decades and those who do live in one room shanties how are they going to be confined you know 10 people in a one room shanty uh how will they uh, how will they eat how will they earn uh and how will they keep so called social distance uh when he says work from home these are 9 out of 10 workers in this country are informal workers they will not get paid if they don't work for a single day and if they don't work they won't get food 9 out of 10 he talks about washing your hands regularly but you know the people who you know again the large majority don't have any kind of running water you just have to get up any morning and stand outside a slum and you'll see how people you know falling over each other to buy a, a, a plastic pot of water for about 1/5 of their earnings so it became completely apparent to me that 
the lockdown, if it was promising safety, it was not promising safety uh, to the large mass of the Indian people. It was promising safety to people like you and me, to the exclusion of the large mass of the Indian people. Uh, what I've tried to argue in the book is the mirror that these last months have shown us, that we are comfortable, we people of relative privilege are comfortable to live in a country where some lives have to be protected and a large number of lives are dispensable, are entirely dispensable. And, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, this unfolded before us. Because I work with homeless people, I decided, you know, I spoke to my wife and I said, you know, whatever happens, I have to be on the streets. And so from the second day, uh, I said, I'll be on the streets, I'll try to do whatever we can in terms of solidarity, freedom. And I was very touched that at least six, eight, then 10 of my young colleagues made the same decision. And so we were out on the streets uh, every day. We had not planned a massive feeding program, but the desperation that we saw, this was the second, third day. Uh, just to illustrate, there's a place called Company Bag uh, near the old Delhi railway station. That's a labor adda where, uh, on an average day, you f morning you find about 1,000 homeless people looking for any work on any terms. By the third day when we reached there, it had already swollen to uh, to about 5,000. And, and 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 they were, you know, the sadness that they spoke about, they said, we didn't see roti in so many days. And we are the roti of making roti. And they used the word karigar, which I liked very much. I mean, that we are artisans uh, and artists. And, and, and we are not being able to, and you, for this ladle of uh, uh, kichdi that we were able to provide, uh, Yamna Pushta has, on an average day, about 4,000 single homeless men. By the time we reached there, we found that it had already swollen to 10,000 people. And it was body packed against body, just waiting that somebody would come and give them food. And just the rumor that somebody is there to provide food, there would be a scramble, they'd fall over each other uh, to reach that little food. Uh, we had no business to reduce our poor people, to strip them of their livelihoods, uh, to strip them of their dignity, to strip them of their hope and faith. Uh, and to, you know, Delhi government, after we made a lot of noise, started distributing food, but it was the same ladles of, of food. Uh, you'd have to get up in the morning, stand in a line in the hot sun, wait for three hours, maybe you'll reach there and you'll get a ladle of food. You go and eat it, you lie down for one hour, and you come back to the same line, and you wait again. This is how uh, the, the migrants who wanted to leave uh, were packed into schools, uh, you know, really crowded, really cramped. And many people said, you know, two or three things that, that I kept hearing. One was that uh, we will not die of corona. Long before that, we'll die of hunger. Uh, and a lot of it was addressed to Mr. Modi. He, he's responsible for, you know, Modi ji ne ye kiya, Modi ji se ye kahi hai. To poochte te ke Modi ji, agar sach moch kehte hain ke hum log you know, ghar se na nikle aur uh, bheer na ho humari. To Modi, Modi ji to zurur chahate honge ke hum mar jayen. Kyunke aur koi tarika nahi hume khana khane ka, except to come out in these crowds, day in, day out. And, and, and you know, and just observing this, uh, and I was seeing what was being reported, so little of this. The only time, I've, I've, you know, I've written often about what I call the exile of the poor from our conscience and our consciousness of the middle class. I think the poor forced their way into our conscience and consciousness during that epic, deeply tragic uh, uh, migrant exodus. The greatest movement of human, distress movement of human populations greater than even the partition. Uh, the only one that is greater than that is the movement of Africans as slaves uh, to the Americas. When we saw that, it, it troubled many of us. But most people said, Are, where, where did these people come from? You know, we didn't know they, they, they all so many migrants. I mean, where are they? We don't see them. And my answer is, wow, you know, 
from before you open your eyes, these are the people who make our life possible. Somebody delivers milk. Somebody delivers your newspapers. Somebody then knocks on your door and comes and uh, uh, cooks your meals, sweeps your floors, takes care of your children, drives you to work. It's these people. And uh, you know, I, I've often thought that we in the middle class really wish we had something like an Aladdin lamp. You just rub the lamp. They should appear from nowhere, do our work. And then we should rub the lamp, and they should disappear. They can't have dreams, aspirations, uh, you know, feelings for their children, and so on. So this was it. I felt that the story was, was completely lost. I mean, the, the tears that one would hear, the, you know, I, I just a couple of, I, I remember we were distributing food near Kashmiri Gate. And this man, young man uh, with his face covered suddenly started, you know, shaking with anger. He was still in the line. And he said, Modi ji kehte hain ki hum ghar mein baith ke wakt guzare apna. Kya hum diwar ke tuklon ko kaat kaat ke khaye? And by the time he reached the edge of the line, he was sort of weeping away. And he took the ladle of food. Uh, in Majno ka Tila, we, uh, we were there and I remember walking past a woman, uh, there were two bricks and she was trying to cook something. And she saw me and she covered uh, what she was cooking with her sari. So I stopped and tried as gently as I could to say, my sister, what is troubling you? And she said, I am ashamed. And I said, why are you ashamed? Then she took off the sari and she said, these are the feet of chickens, which in normal times, everybody throws away as, as waste. And I've been reduced to this situation that the only food I can now afford to feed my children is the feet of chicken. And so I'm ashamed. And I try to tell her, please, it's not you who should be ashamed. It is we who should be ashamed. And our government, which should be ashamed. You should hold your head really high. Uh, because uh, in all of these circumstances, you're still holding your family together. And, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, one woman, uh, she was smiling when she said, I, I, I started taking uh, a young colleague who wanted to also be on the streets with a camera. And I said, let me you know, keep reinventing yourself. So I became a reporter for those, those days. So we would uh, distribute the food. Then I would stand in front of him and would talk about what we saw. And those reports went around the world. They had million hits. Because we told the story, and I remember in one place, this lady said, I want to, I want to speak in front of your camera, I said, by all means. And uh, she seemed quite cheerful. And then as soon as the camera came, she said, they were distributing food in a school. We all ran there. We stood in a line for so long. Lekin khana khatam ho gaya. Do kele hume diye. And she started weeping. She said, mere ghar chaliye. Mera chula saat dinon se... Jala hi nahi hai, koi khana hi nahi hai. I have, you know, I have dealt with, uh, I was commissioner of the Supreme Court on the right to food for 12 years, looking at starvation deaths. I've been a collector in six districts. I've seen rural hunger, occasions of mass rural hunger. I've never seen this in a city. Because the city, please understand, people come to the city because if you're willing to work, uh, do completely degrading low-end work, You'll never be without, without work. Uh, you, you can pick waste. That is, a street child, within a week of coming, even this small, learns how to earn 100, 150 rupees. Sanjoy, of course, works with the, these children. Uh, and uh, there is a little bit, I mean, they're always a heartbeat away from hunger. But hunger, especially mass hunger, is, is not what you see in cities. And here we saw mass hunger completely created by the state. And the anguish that I used to come back with, I, I felt the only way I could deal with this, with it was to start writing. So I started writing about the hunger, then analyzing, then I read. And uh, you know, in our conversations, I, I, I will try to argue that I believe that uh, you know, it, it would be a great mistake for us to say that our people suffered in millions because of the virus. It had nothing to do with the virus. It had to do with public policy choices now and in the past, which are completely callous, completely shorn of compassion. Uh, and, and 
uh, and then we were asked to applaud and come onto our balconies. Of course, you had to have a balcony to come and applaud. And, uh, and people came enthusiastically. I just kept saying, could we have some people who said, you know, I can't applaud. You know, I'm seeing what's happening to poor people. The breakdowns of our solidarity, and I'll end here, uh, in Kota, for instance, they finally, our, our, our children were caught up there. They sent buses to transport them. That was exactly the time when an estimated 30 million people were, were you know, you were kept in a container which was completely airless. They were paying 4,000, 5,000 rupees, which is more than I would spend on a, on a flight uh, to be transported. And I would be beaten and I would be humiliated. And I was saying that in all of Kota, could there have been one student, just one student, who says, I refuse to get onto this bus. I refuse to be transported home in safety until you provide the same services to the migrants on the streets. That is what solidarity is about. And that is what is completely broken down. And, and it is really uh, to talk about this, to understand it. So I wrote initially about 20,000 words. Uh, my editor, Ravi, I, I don't see him here. He's the best editor I know. And uh, he's done a lot of my books. But when he read that, he said, Harsh, I think this is, this is a book that people are going to read 50 years from now to understand. And he then started a conversation. So every day he would read more. He would ask me more questions. Uh, I would study. I would understand. And it grew to 66,000 words or something. And, uh, uh, and that's the book. That's how it came about. Thank you. Harsh, it's a... Harsh? Well, it's an occasion where I feel like touching your feet. I've known of you a long time. I've known you occasionally and in intense encounters. When you wrote this book, I bought the book. And I started reading. And then Sanjay sent me a message to say that would I converse with you on this stage about this book? And can we send you a copy of the book at home? for me to read. I said, I'm well through this book. It's full of notes, annotations. It was, I was halfway through at the time and it's carried on. Yes, do give me another copy, which I'll get Hush to sign, which he's done gracefully for me today. Uh, this great book, Hush, uh, your editor is right. I'd made the notes myself, which I shared with you, Sanjoy. I didn't know that the editor had said this to him. I said, this is a landmark book in India's history. This book is a book that all those privileged people like ourselves who say that we care for the people of our country and the greatness of our country must read. And we must read it again. I'm saying a year from now. Why am I saying this? This book is about three stories. It's the story of what happened to the majority of the people of this country, the poor of this country, during the pandemic. And Harsh, you shared those stories, some of them, with us. Those stories and pictures, like you say, that container, or that woman with the chicken's feet, we must make a museum. It's like the Holocaust Museum, so that we shall never forget. We shall never forget that we allowed it to happen just like it was said for the German people and for the whole people of the world, that while you were there, close to you or far from you, you allowed it to happen. We have allowed to happen what Harsh has written about story one in the book. The second story is the brutality of government policies that, as Harsh said, killed more people from the effects of those policies than COVID has killed. And the third story is the one you have already highlighted, which we should talk most about, because it's about us. It's about the indifference. It's not all of us, perhaps, 
but I think of myself, and I think, no, I do care. But Harsh, you came to see me when I was in the planning commission. You came to recommend that the planning commission support a scheme to provide facilities for homeless people in the cities, which you alluded to now. And I remember, I do believe that I'm a compassionate person, that I care for poor people and less privileged people. But when it came to helping you get that scheme going, I was arguing like an economist. I was arguing like a great manager. But how will this happen? Then jumping to the conclusion, you got a bad idea. And then how to dismiss you, looking you in the eye and saying, he's an impractical guy. And here's Harsh Mandar from the IAS, who has, in tough circumstances, been able to provide care and succor for such people, which is why he was recommending the scheme. But I dismissed you as one of those jholawalas. You were the National Advisory Council. Yeah? I was the planning commission. We know how to do these things. So that third story is the story about us and our ideas. And I want to engage you right now much more in the second two stories, because the first story, you've shared some thoughts. And if you, I will bring up some of those thoughts again. OK, so let me, um, I've got so many things uh, in this book to uh, ask Harsh about, but we have a limited time. So we've said the first is a, a compendium of stories which must be converted. And I'm wondering, uh, Sanjoy, whenever we come and celebrate people like us and talk about big ideas and literature at the Jaya Poetry Festival, there should be at the entrance a Holocaust museum, a COVID-19 museum to remind us who we are. The second story is the story of uh, uh, the government's misguided policies, which is a story of three diseases. The centralization of power, the siloization of expertise, and you explained that so well in your book, and this ambition to meet targets by polishing the numbers. All three are the stories of our policies, government policies. Hmm? So let's take some of those stories that you have uh, uh, and thoughts and sentences about the second story, because we should, I think, talk about it. The first is the centralization of power. Now here, page 156, right? You say here, The second uh, problem, and the biggest problem, which is directly related to the, the whole situation, is the PMO-centric, or rather PM-centric, nature of the COVID-19, and indeed every other task force. Task forces handpicked bureaucrats, they're handpicked bureaucrats and key officials, who operate around the powerful prime minister's office, and you say that the PM as the final say in each and every decision. The second is the siloization of expertise. And this I won't even uh, delve into your book, but to say that we have, and it's not us only, the whole world, other than a few countries, and you name those, began to trust doctors to find the solution to what you believe, they believe was a pure medical problem. And the doctors then devised the solution, which they felt was going to prevent us from getting disease, which is social distancing and the masks. Right? And we must trust the doctors. They are the experts. It's a medical problem, right? They are saying so, so then impose it. So I'm going to excuse Mr. Modi for this, please. He was listening to the experts that he should have listened to, which is doctors. And so we were blaming Mr. Trump for not listening to the doctors, and maybe Biden is much more now and others were. So that was one. But the doctors themselves didn't know what this was. And they were very narrow in trying to save people from only COVID. And you got stories here about how to meet the numbers of how many beds had now been provided for COVID. People couldn't go to the hospitals for any other treatment. And more people were suffering and dying from treatments which India had the ability to prevent them from dying from because we wanted to 
show the world and show our own people that we can handle this COVID better than anyone else. Now, just look, the medical profession, meanwhile, has been very careful and cautious about allowing vaccines to be released. Why? They must be tested properly because they can be unintended effects, second order effects. So be careful and cautious before you prescribe the cure, which is the vaccine. But the cure, which is the lockdown, without asking what could be the second order effect, it is so imposed. Now, this is a problem not just of the government presently. It is a problem of how we devise our policies. We expect, and agriculture is an interesting one also, right? And experts in that subject, and they will tell us the solution to something which is so complex and interrelated with other matters. For us people, because we look to providing solutions, I do suggest you read his examples of how this orientation that leave it to the expert and then follow the expert in a problem which has many, many dimensions to it causes more harm than good. And so the number of people, as you said, who died of other things rather than COVID is much higher in India than was before and perhaps uh, continues to be higher than other countries. The third one, and I'm going to lay out the three then I'm going to ask you, what do you think is the way to change this orientation? Meeting the targets and polishing the numbers. You already I mentioned to you about uh, how many beds have we provided and so on. I was reading uh, The Failure of the Indian State by a journalist, uh, despite the Indian state, how the poor are able to live. And he points out that in public health, which is your subject and you've written very well, that by thinking that the two targets, which is infant mortality, or child malnutrition, as well as maternity, yeah, uh, deaths and due to uh, maternal Ill, Ill care, are the ways to judge whether the public health system is working. And in Tamil Nadu, which has the best public health system had on all our states, in the last few years, to be ranked highest in public health, you got to go highest on those two metrics. They have been shutting down the care of other matters so that women can be into a hospital for delivery, the right place, and so on. So this whole fetish for concentrating on one or two numbers and then to be the best, ranked the best in those two numbers, is causing more harm to us. Now, you work on the ground, so harsh, and you worked also as a person who's been implementing and advising people. How can we cure this disease? Uh, thanks, uh, Arun, uh, great, great summary. Uh, the thing I want to underline first is what millions of people in our country today have been thrust into probably the greatest humanitarian crisis that most of us here, except those who've lived through partition and uh, the Great Bengal Famine, will see in our lifetimes. And this, this enormous humanitarian crisis had nothing to do with the virus. It had to do with how we chose to respond to it. That's something that I, and I, I will argue, and I'll, I've said this very strongly. Uh, I'm attacked all the time. And this will, is, will be one more reason. I have described what our government chose to do as equivalent to a crime against humanity. And let me, let me explain why I said this. And it's not just what this government has done. Uh, you know, there's a, a cumulative set of failures. Uh, let me start with what happened to informal labor. I mean, that we have uh, the large mass, 9 out of 10 workers, have no security at all. The extraordinary thing was that, uh, OK, the lockdown, India went in for a 100% lockdown with three and a half, four hours notice. China, which invented the idea of the lockdown, more or less, at its peak, locked down 5% of its population. We had just 500 people recorded infections at that time. Every day, our, our uh, railways carry 23 million passengers. They, when we had just 500 uh, cases, could we not have said, you know, where would I want to be if suddenly a disease has enveloped us 
which has brought the world on its knees, I would want to be with people who love me. Even if you know, we are poor, at least I won't be alone. Was that so difficult to understand? Poor people are not people like you and I. So we organize special Vande Matram, whatever they're called, uh, flights, etc., for people abroad to come back to their families. But we don't feel the need to do it. It just required maybe one week, we would just run the trains free uh, for migrants to return to their home. They, when there were just 500 cases, there would have been very little infection spread. Instead, we did not allow them. So where were they? They were trapped in these uh, you know, shanties, by and large. Now, in those shanties, there's nothing that this virus loves more than tightly packed, undernourished bodies. And so we instead, by our policy choices, created hothouses for the massive expansion uh, and spread and super spread of the virus. So not only did you cause all of this suffering, then thirdly, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Prabhat Patnaik, who I respect as an economist, probably most after Amartya Sen and Joyti Ghosh, uh, we, uh, we wrote a, a few opinion pieces together pleading that, you know, if we in the middle class are staying at home and getting our salaries, the least you can do is to provide the equivalent of minimum wages to every person. And we calculated it was 7,000 rupees a family. And interestingly, it would have cost us less than 3% of the GDP. Incidentally, if we had done that, we would not have been in the economic crisis that we are seeing today, because demand would not have been shut down overnight. Uh, uh, so, so compassion. I mean, I, I, I really feel that what was most spectacularly mus missing was the hubris and the total absence of compassion. And I'll again say something very provocative, uh, not because I enjoy saying provocative things, but it is, you know, it's really striking. Who do we compare ourselves with? China, on the one hand, I've already spoken about China, and Pakistan. You know, when Pakistan, Imran Khan, this playboy, doesn't, you know, very distant from the poor, etc., etc., when he was recommended that you go in for a total lockdown like India, he said, and he used a very beautiful phrase, he said, what will happen to my poor people if we lock down the country? Uh, they don't have work, they won't be able to eat. I cannot allow this to happen. This is what he said, and he refused. Now the irony is, Pakistan, I've been there a few times, it's by no means a well-governed uh, country, far from it. The mere fact that they showed this elementary public compassion, their figures today, both for COVID control and economic sort of uh, performance, is much better than India. Are you understanding why I'm saying it was a crime against humanity? That you impose this degree of suffering, which only much worsened the situation. Uh, I can give you many examples. You asked about the decision. There's enough evidence now, Arunjay, that a large segment of epidemiologists in government strongly recommended against the lockdown. Those, those uh, people like Nathan Sethi have unearthed those papers. I really want to know, I don't know whether we'll ever ha understand, who took this decision, on whose advice? The country's epidemiologists, by and large, said this will be disastrous. The cabinet was not consulted. The chief ministers were not consulted. Who was consulted? Who took this decision? And on what grounds? Uh, one more thing I wanted to say, I mean, I can go on. Uh, and we have the example of other countries. But if we didn't go in for a lockdown, what could we do? I mean, the key was testing, testing, testing. Uh, we don't want to polish the figures. We don't want to hide infections. In fact, we go to the other extreme, like South Korea. Every metro station, you can go and test yourself free. Uh, every bus stand, you can test yourself free. The moment you're tested, if you're found positive, they'll trace. And without a lockdown, South Korea did wonderfully. Much poorer countries like Vietnam did much better than us. And one of the things, I mean, I, I, it might sound a little sort of over the top, but it's interesting that some of the best countries in the world in response, New Zealand, were all led by women. 
न्यूजीलैंड न्यूजीलैंड ताइवान जर्मनी फिनलैंड डेनमार्क ऑल लेड बाय वेमेन ऑल लेड बाय लीडर्स हु कंटिन्यूसली स्पोक विद देयर पीपल आंसर्ड क्वेश्चन री अशोर्ड स्पोक अबाउट वॉलिनेबिलिटी स्पोक अबाउट शेयर देयर ओन काइंड ऑफ एंड एंड and brought people on board made them partners in this enterprise no arrogant i mean nobody would explain to us i mean one of the things i i've been a district collector you you decided to have a uh, night curfew now i can understand a night curfew in a law and order situation why are you having a night curfew in a uh, in in a health emergency uh, do you have some secret scientific studies which show that the virus suddenly became extremely active once it became dark then please share please share those and if you don't have that then what is the business about uh, imposing a, a you know nobody bothered to explain one day they would say you know this policy the next day they will reverse it and do the other policy so the way they try to deal with it is far from test 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 they would narrow more and more the number of people who were eligible to be tested uh I as I said I went out among the homeless I was expecting very early to get infected and it was part of my bargain with myself with my family uh I started sleeping in a separate room from my wife I wouldn't meet my mother in law wouldn't meet my father but I didn't get infected so I asked doctors here how do you explain that and they said you were actually probably in the safest population on the planet because it's the destitute poor who have nothing to do with Uh, middle class people we were the source of the infection our domestic helpers got the infection they did not so although i was holding them carrying them etc i didn't get it it was when they opened up that i started finding uh, that infections had started i spoke to the highest levels of the delhi government i mean central government there's no point in my even trying to speak but uh, they wouldn't agree they said we will not test chalo let us test we will i'll raise the money we'll create all the equipment we don't allow you to test are why can't you allow us to test you test or let us test okay we have a policy now only of home quarantine what about people who don't have homes what about people whose homes are so small which is a large majority of, where will they quarantine no answer okay now we started screening with msf we set up a clinic uh we started screening they said uh and we found 15 20% positivity it was frightening uh but we had to take them to a government clinic each time to get them tested now we go to the government clinic the first day they say we will test only we have orders we can only test people who have an aadhar card with a delhi address so i said you know how ridiculous is that yeah let somebody even come from mars and and have covid and if he he's spreading it here you have to treat him and uh, protect the rest of us uh then i wrote to the health minister and said i'm going to make this into a national issue i give you two days they would do the order finally but you know it is this completely unscientific etc and the last thing is that why it is cumulative india's for profit healthcare systems of which we are beneficiaries we get the best services in the world 80% 80% of doc- trained doctors in this country work for the for profit sector they have been educated by and large by your taxes and mine they feel they own nothing the kind of uh, of uh, extortion that they that they undertook it was left to the 20% working with public systems and some of them behaved very well and heroically but there were significant sections who did not when i finally got covid because of the clinic i said i i will go finally to a, a public hospital but i said i i will go only to a public hospital and to the general ward of the public hospital it was a decision which almost killed me but it was so close to hell uh you know we this is the premier institute of this country you find a situation i walk in this is lie down wherever you feel like but aren't you going to give me some clothes no 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 we don't have anything you just lie down okay uh monitor there's a monitor screaming behind me but actually it's not working uh, so at home somebody was testing my oxygen now nobody was testing anything i lay down in my clothes uh there were about 50 people there six eight of them thought they were about to die and they were lamenting and crying away uh the uh the nurses and ward boys even at 2:00 o'clock at night would be screaming 
because I like to do it, I started talking to the ward boys, trying to understand. Uh, I discovered that the ward boys were almost entirely untrained completely. Because the trained ward boys refused to work in the COVID clinic. So I used to work in a hotel in Connaught Place, which shut down as a room boy. Uh, my, I lost my job. My family was starving. So uh, All India Institute said, anyone who's willing to work in the COVID ward, we'll take you. So I'm working here with no idea, no training. The Prime Minister says, we have created one lakh beds. It's he, as very often he is, is to put it as politely as I can, it was very economical with the truth. Uh, because one lakh new beds were not created. One lakh beds were repurposed. And just to give you an example of what repurposing means, in, in Bombay, Mumbai, uh, two cancer wards, were, for instance, converted into COVID wards. The cancer patients were taken and placed under uh, flyovers on mats. Uh, during this period, you know, the amount of unsafe deliveries that happened, what happened to abortions? TB, TB requires, you know, I work with homeless people with TB. There's an explosion of TB infections. Arsha, I want to... <coughs> sorry, sorry. I, 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 I could... No, go. because, yes, she's telling me, and you said so, that the most important thing is not the COVID virus. There's another virus, which is a virus of hate. And you've been trying to save us from the virus of hate against the minorities of this country. What you pointed out in the book, there's another virus. It's a virus of indifference. And it's we, the minority, are, if I might say, subjugating the majority of this country, the 90%, because we want to live well. And there's a sentence here in your book which says, with the nationwide lockdown, the government drew a cordon around the bodies it wished to protect, pulling up the drawbridges to guard the chosen, those who could afford to stay in. You decided to go to a public ward. Uh, I wouldn't dare. On the bodies of those, it, outside this charmed circle, the lockdown wrought, ha wrought havoc. So we're talking of testing. Yes, testing for COVID, we didn't do it well. It should have done much more. The testing of the virus, infection of the virus of hatred, you know, social media and Facebook and others trying to figure out how they can test for who has hate. But this testing for the virus of indifference, it, it is testing us. And at the start, as you said, pulling up the drawbridges, it wasn't just the government. People like myself, where I live, we were shutting out of our mind those people who the stories were there because we wished to protect ourselves. They were bringing infection in. We needed them, but they were bringing infection in. Whereas the truth was, as we learned, our people returning from abroad were bringing infection and they were getting it from us. So there is a disease of indifference amongst people like us. And this is the disease which is <clears throat> Causing the government, if I might put it, I mean, let's excuse them a bit, to take stances, to adopt ideas which are not good for the majority of the people of this country. How would you suggest we do something about this? Uh, that's ultimately the purpose of this book. I, I don't think the problem is out there in, in a Mr. Modi or, uh, or uh, an Amit Shah. Uh, in fact, when I took part in anti-CA protests, if people said Modi Buntabad, I would try to stop them. I wish him good health uh, and a long life. The problem is not him, it's us. We are electing him, he's not forcing his way. We have to understand what is it that is, that draws us uh, to leaders and, you know, we could have argued in 2014 that uh, we were hoping that jobs would be created, the economy would be improved, farmers, uh, conditions would be uh, uh, you know, enhanced. In 2019, nothing was on offer except hate. Hate against Muslims within, hate against Pakistan outside. His vote share rose to 37.6% of the vote share, of which 36% was Hindu. Every third Dalit also voted for the BJP in 2019. 
we're seeing, uh, you know, something that, you know, Samar Halankar wrote about recently and Apurvanan. Uh, we are a few people who keep it. We're seeing a massive radicalization of the Indian Hindu. And we're not confronting it. We're not recognizing it. We're not calling it by that name. I spent three years in Karwane Mohabbat going to every corner of the country where people have been lynched. And the levels of hatred uh, that were unleashed. Uh, families had begun to say, yaar, bas goli maar dete. Bas chura hi maar dete. Phir bhi hum jhel lete. Itna torture karke kyo maara. They gouged out their eyes. They smashed their genitals with stones. Place after place after place. And when I would go, uh, you know, in riots, even in Gujarat, I have seen, uh, you know, I could deal and heal from Gujarat, although the cruelty was extreme there. I mean, you'd have a story of a boy this big and in Naroda Patia, and he says, I'm desperately thirsty. And they show him a knife, make him drink a bottle of petrol, then make him open his mouth and put a lighted match, and he bursts. I mean, those are the kinds of things. For months, I was, uh, I was in extreme sort of post-traumatic distress. I then relocated there, uh, spent almost a year, and I kept returning. But in that year, I went village to village, and one thing I found was that the number of people who saved lives among the Hindus was at least three times as many as those who took their lives. And I think that's, that didn't happen in Germany. Schindler became a hero because he was so rare. I can find you a Schindler in every street corner. I think that is what is, or I'm sad, sad to sort of say, has been, was, will be, what we can be most proud about in our civilization history. But what happened in the law, uh, when the lynchings happened is, I would almost just say, I would almost say, I would almost say, I would almost say, I would almost say, and the answer was, every, every time, no one came. You know, I, I have hundreds of examples. Hapur mein yahan pe, uh, just close to Delhi, uh, hardly an hour, hour and a half away. There's an old man of 45, he could hardly walk. His, he was very poor. Uh, his jo work used to be that he would buy uh, small uh, kid goats and then fatten them up in his house and sell them and earn maybe one or two thousand rupees uh, in a month. And that is how the family survived. Suddenly somebody said from the temple that he had killed a cow. And a crowd gathered, and he was hardly able to walk. And this is people, I mean, the young, and most of them were children. And these are people you've seen, like your father, somebody who's been in your village. And they came with whatever, uh, you know, weapons. I'm, I, I'm sorry to be so gruesome. They, uh, knives, screwdrivers, pens. I mean, pens as weapons I heard of in different contexts, but pens. And the family said there wasn't a part of his body which was not pierced by his own neighbors. So there's a, a mainstreaming of hate uh, that we have seen. And I think this is what our government has taught us. It has legitimized, it has valorized it. Uh, um, uh, just uh, sorry, I, but I did, it would be an in, in, in incomplete story if I didn't talk about what, what the lockdown showed me also, hmm. was the levels of kindness. I mean, it was yes. incredible. It was incredible. It was heartening. Not just my own young colleagues. I mean, uh, I, I, when I went out, I thought I'd be alone or with one person, but uh, more and more came. And I asked them, Aapko dar nahi lag hai. And one boy re replied, Corona se mujhe to dar hai, lekin mere dar se bahut bada hai un unki bhook. Uh, they told their families they will not come back these months. They stayed in the office. Uh, uh, and they would go out every day. And it was not just our people. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have told you the story if it was just about our people. But uh, I would, when every day on the streets, I would find, you know, just ordinary middle class people driving up. When the migrants were walking, it, you, I used to just stand there and you'd see one car packed with, uh, you know, uh, pouches of water and food. And they'd come, they'd stop, they'd distribute it to people, they'd drive on, a next one would come, a next one would come. None of this was permitted formally by the state, but the cops showed kindness. Uh, none of us had papers. They would see, Acha, ab ye they, they would tell me, Ke itna bura ho hai. After all, they're the same families, I mean, of the migrants. I mean, this could have been their brother, this could have been their son. 
and they were very supportive of all of this. Uh, the, the only other thing that I wanted to add was that my, much more than the middle class, it was the poor and the very poor and what they did to other poor people. Uh, a book that I really recommend that we all uh, go back to, uh, even if you have to choose between this and that book, uh, it is John Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath, where he talks about the Great Recession. And he talks about a very similar period that unfolded in the U US. But what was, I mean, I read the book as a child, I kept reading it, because what was most beautiful in the book was this, dis this description of the very destitute and dispossessed and how they took care of other people. And the final sequence in the book, actually, I remember till today, um, this woman, her, uh, she was feeding her baby, the baby was starving, finally the baby died. And there was an old man who was almost dead and there was no food. And she goes to the old man and she offers her breast and gives him milk so that he survives. And in a very symbolic way, uh, it was. I saw, you know, over and over again, I, I remember Nizamuddin in the early days, I saw this man, I was just used to talk to them, okay, up, how have you managed? He said, I had a little money saved up, I'm all alone. And so I started buying food. But don't think I bought food only for myself. How could I, this family, I have nothing to do with them, but they have two small children. If I ate and they didn't eat, uh, how could I live with myself? So I used the, my savings to buy food for myself and these children. You know, it is this kindness of the poor uh, that I think will still hold us together if we don't lose it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sorry, there's one story of defense colony, and I, you know, I think we all know it, but it needs reiteration. Uh, early in the curfew, a uh, uh, person, you know, uh, Old, an old couple and their son, who was also quite old, uh, were in hospital battling COVID. Uh, the father, grandfather died. Uh, the mother and the son barely survived. While all of this was happening, somebody in the family thought it fit to file a complaint in the police about their security guard, who was a Muslim, saying that he deliberately, uh, he hid the fact he was in the markas, he went to Nizamuddin, he brought the infection to us, and, and because of him, we've got infected. The police happily, completely registers a complaint against him. The man runs away, he becomes a fugitive. They finally find him very quickly. They test him, and he turns out to be negative. He keeps pleading, I never went to the markas. Even if he had, it was not a crime, but he, he said, I didn't, I don't, the Bliki Jamaat is one tiny faction. Uh, nobody apologized to him. Uh, then it turns out that their grandson used to study abroad, and he had come back. And so where did, he get, where did they get the infection? What was, were they not infect, they were th infecting the, the security guard, not the security guard who was infecting them. Nobody apologized. Two, two weeks later, I read a story, and it turns out to be the same family, where they still can't survive without a domestic help, so they get a girl from Jharkhand, 18 years old, and they say, We'll keep you, but first we have to test you uh, for uh, COVID. Uh, the test results come at 10 o'clock at night, and she turns out to be positive. And they say, you have to get out of the house now. And it's total curfew, dark night, a village girl from 18 years old from Jharkhand, and they turn her onto the streets. She's wailing away. She's desperately uh, frightened. And it is only that some security guards, some other residents, took some care of her, they found a brother, uh, and got her to safety. But I think this, this story, uh, and I end actually my chapter when I call it as a moment of civilizational introspection. Arundhati Roy says somewhere, said in a conversation with me, with us, she said, uh, COVID-19 is a virus, but it's also an X-ray. Uh, it's an X-ray of our society. And what has been revealed in this X-ray let us have the courage to look at that X-ray carefully. What does it say about us? And we started getting distress calls about domestic helpers. And we used to go to these apartment places, all locked up. The, all the domestic helpers were outside. And we quickly realized that uh, the employers of those domestic helpers uh, would contact us to give them food uh, and food packets. And you couldn't spend, uh, uh, it used to cost about 1,000 rupees for 10 days of ration. They couldn't spend 1,000 rupees uh, uh, for somebody who's been working 
uh, for years in your home. I mean, we've revealed ourselves to be among the most uncaring people in the world. And I underline that. And so it's a crime against humanity by our governments, enabled by our support. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you. We shall not forget. Thank you, Harsh Mandar and Arun Myra, for that heart-wrenching session. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all those stories with us. We thank our partner, The Daily Hunt, for their support on this session. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo. The festival is protected by Detol. Thank you.